is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have coming in from Auburn, Alabama, Peter St. Ange. Uh, he uh, is uh, used to be a fellow in, uh, a fellow at the Mises Institute, uh, and he's back in the region there now. He's also an assistant profense, professor at Funja University in Taiwan, uh, where he splits his time. Uh, he's also uh, has a website where he talks about the markets and finance, and he's really a, an expert in Austrian economics and those sort of things. So we're going to get into a lot of sort of finance and Austrian economics uh, type of things here today. Also, maybe a little bit of entrepreneurship, which he also uh, does uh, teach people on. Uh, but before we get into all that, Peter, I have to ask you, how did you become an anarchist? Uh, well, uh, I did my undergraduate at uh, McGill uh, over in Montreal, and it was a completely mainstream program. I had no exposure at all to Austrian economics. Uh, I found a book by Mark Skousen, uh, called uh, The Making of Modern Economics in 2001, just randomly in a bookstore. Read through that. That was my first contact with Austrian economics. Uh, that led me to uh, Hayek. And then, you know, it, 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 Hayek's kind of a gateway drug, right? And I think everybody ends up with Rothbard. Uh, so Rothbard for me was, was just, uh, you know, kind of life-changing. Um, so anyway, from that, then I went to George Mason, you know, which is kind of an Austrian program uh, about... Probably half of the people there are Austrians. The other half are uh, what's called public choice, right? Which is the economics of basically government failure. Uh, so that's how I got into it. It was Mark Skousen's book. That's great, Mark Skousen. For those who don't know, uh, is uh, he has Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. I've been to his conference many times. Uh, he's a great Austrian economics advocate. Um, and yeah, there's so many things to talk about when it comes to Austrian economics right now, especially how uh, the Keynesians seem to be really just going gangbusters at the moment. Uh, I just saw on Bloomberg Business Week, uh, the, I forget the exact headline, but it was something along the lines of uh, what we read, need right now is more, keen, more Keynes or Keynes, whatever, however you say his stupid name, that idiot. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's amazing how uh, we just talked about this before we were on, how people just keep falling for these, these same old things that they keep doing. And, and once again, we see the markets at all-time highs as, as, as we speak. Who knows by the time this gets on air, it's been so volatile lately. Uh, but it's just amazing to see how people just keep falling for the same things over and over again. Yeah, well, it's a pattern that, you know, it was basically established in the Great Depression, right, which is that you use Keynesian economics to destroy the economy. And then once you've destroyed the economy, you say, aha, well, we, we need more Keynes. <laughs> no, no matter what the problem is, the solution is more Keynes. That's exactly what's going on uh, yet again. I can't believe it's happening again. And people like Paul Krugman, that's what they always say. That's what they always say whenever they, they do all these Keynesian sort of things. They, they print a ton of money. Uh, they, when the economy is not doing so well in their uh, idea, uh, they say, oh, well, the government has to go more into debt because someone has to be going into debt or else the economy can't work. And then, like you pointed out, every single time it results in failure. And then they say, we just didn't do it hard enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's amazing to see it's happening all over again. Uh, what's your perspective on where this is all headed right now? Uh, I think short term defined as say the next year. Uh, I think that we're probably uh, not going to have any kind of a major crash. Um, you know, one of the first rules in uh, financial uh, prediction is that you don't do it, right? Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of lines on Wall Street, you know, um, the market will do whatever will embarrass the most people, you know, things like that. Uh, so, but anyway, um, you know, the main indicators that I do look at are all Austrian. Uh, and, you know, when you look at money creation, uh, credit stress, uh, when you look at the amount of money going into consumption versus uh, investment, right? Uh, when you look at uh, these indicators, uh, w the economy is not really in a lot of stress right now. Uh, I don't care um, about what happens after a year simply because, okay, you can sell a stock in about five seconds. All right, so, you know, assuming that you're watching things, um, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter at any given moment what's gonna happen a year from now. Why a year? Because of tax efficiency, okay? It's, for US citizens, it's uh, cheaper to do things one year at a time. So anyway, right, so for the next year, which is, you know, generally my investment horizon, I'm not that concerned. Um, you know, you wanna keep an eye on, on those kinds of indicators 
Now, you know, past a year from now, yes, there's, you know, quite a bit of concern. Right, uh, you know, in the next two to five years, let's say, um, I think it's pretty likely that we'll have some kind of a recession. Uh, it'll probably look a bit like 2008. Um, we're actually kind of for bad reasons. Um, we're probably unlikely to have another uh, financial crisis uh, in the U.S. Uh, it may occur in Europe because the numbers are bigger. Um, the hand, it, well, anyway, uh, the government's more involved. But in the U.S., it's <clears throat> probably unlikely. And the reason is, is, is not really a good one, okay? The reason <clears throat> is because um, the great question was, will the government bail out the financial sector when it shoots itself in the foot? And unfortunately, that question has substantially been answered. Right? And the answer is yes, they will give them trillions and trillions of dollars for free. Okay, so because that's been resolved, uh, in one sense, it makes us less likely to have a financial crisis because we, the voters, will just get fleeced next time. Um, on the other hand, that's, that's not an altogether good thing, right? That just means that the robbery has become institutionalized uh, since the 08 crisis. Yeah, no, everything's institutionalized uh, now. Um, I'm a little bit more uh, dire on things than you are. I think uh, we could see massive uh, changes in the next year. Um, and uh, I actually think it's going to start in Japan right now. Japan looks to be the, the worst. You're over in Taiwan a lot. Do you pay much attention to what's going on in Japan? Uh, I do, uh, with the Abenomics, right, which is just standard Keynesian, you know, textbook, uh, which is what they've been doing for 20 years now, right? So, you know, if it doesn't work, as you said earlier, just do more. <laughs> and, you know, Abenomics is kind of a, um, an acceleration. Uh, what, so the first point on Japan is that the Japanese economy is actually not that bad, um, so let me define that. Uh, you know, if you match up Japan's GDP per capita, okay, which is basically measuring how rich you know the uh, typical person is, um, if you if you measure that against the U.S., it's almost identical for about the past 20 years. Okay, so either Japan's not that bad, or America's a lot worse than people think. You know, depending on how you look at it. But anyway, Japan is not an outlier. Okay, Japan's doing about as good as the U.S. over the past 20 years. Now, you know, the reason for the uh, sort of myth that Japan is doing so badly, um, you know, it has to do with uh, basically how GDP is measured. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it doesn't control for population growth. Uh, it doesn't control for, um, for inflation. Right, so that's kind of the first point is that Japan is not um, this horrific basket case any more than the U.S. is a horrific basket case. Um, but then, you know, the second point there is that, you know, one of the um, sort of common refrains in Japan is that this has been a golden depression, okay, that people have not really been suffering very much, okay. And indeed, you know, unemployment is low in Japan, the quality of life has not deteriorated. Um, and I think the reason for that is that Japan's been relatively hard money, okay, the Bank of Japan uh, has resisted the sort of Keynesian instincts of the government. Uh, and has, you know, wanted to keep money relatively tight. Uh, that's why the yen got so strong, right? For a while there, the yen was like 77 to a dollar. Okay, so the Bank of Japan was kind of, you know, they were kind of the adults running the show. And what Abe has done is basically broken the will of the Bank of Japan through using political threats, right? The, the sort of standard game is that politicians tell central bankers that if you guys don't do what we want, then we're going to put more political control over you, right? We're going to, we're going to take your toys away, okay? Uh, so Abe used that on the Bank of Japan, and, you know, you could kind of ram that through by um, relying on this myth that Japan is in such bad shape. And so now the Japanese saver is basically unprotected, right? The Japanese saver is now no more protected than the American saver, right? So now it's, it's, it's kind of off to the races uh, with Japan. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, especially with the debt load of the J Japanese government. I think that's the real linchpin is uh, uh, it's just such a massive amount now that uh, they can't allow interest rates to rise very much. So we'll see what happens over there. It's going to be interesting. Um, uh, one of the things, other things you talk about is uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, how, how are you involved in that? Right. So I teach, um, it's called strategic management uh, over at Fongja. Uh, in practice, I teach... <laughs> 
essentially all uh, Austrian views of uh, the market process. Uh, you know, there are a lot of fundamental differences um, between the Austrian view and the mainstream. In this case, in microeconomics, meaning the economics dealing with firms and businesses, things like that, in micro, uh, Keynes didn't really have much to say. Um, the main uh, sort of, uh, you know, mainstream fallacies are coming out of the so-called Chicago School. Uh, any of you who've, you know, taken a sort of standard economics course, everything you learned is more or less uh, Chicago. So, you know, you have this perfectly competitive market and, you know, the only way you can make money is by um, uh, having some sort of an unfair advantage. Um, and, you know, Austrian theory is very different than that, right? Austrian theory at its core, in my mind anyway, says that, look, the way to be good at business is Try and get good at it, right? get better and better every day, and this is how uh, you're going to make money. Okay? You don't need any kind of uh, special market structure. Uh, so that's kind of on a theoretical level, um, but I think on a broader level, right, one of the most interesting uh, things that's happening in the world today is that, you know, bit, uh, thanks largely to the Internet, um, and this is something that you know, I'll be talking about at uh, Anarchapulco, the gatekeepers are kind of coming down. Okay, they're, they're, they're losing their power, right? And a big way that's happening is that it is extraordinarily easy, cheap, uh, to start a business today, right? Because of the internet, okay? You can get free distribution, right? I can start a blog tonight in 10 minutes and have the exact same distribution as the New York Times, right? In historical terms, that's shocking, right? And, and I mean, for sure, this is something that you're aware of in your own business. Right, the costs are just, uh, I mean, it's just astounding uh, how much they're falling. So what this means is that in the past, right, you had to approach investors, or maybe you had to have your own money, you had to be a rich guy, uh, or the route that most people took is that they had to go through some existing company. Right? So you know, if you wanted to become a thought leader, you had to go through the New York Times. You, know, you couldn't just do it on your own. Right? You couldn't just wake up one morning and decide, hey, I'm going to contribute my voice. You know, Good luck with that, right? <laughs> you know, you'd be standing on a street corner. <laughs> so, um, but right, that's, that's something that I try to drive home um, to students is that, I mean, this is just an absolute golden age for entrepreneurs, right? It has never been easier. You can address not just, you know, the entire, uh, I mean, you know, you can address the entire world. I mean, that's just, uh, that's shocking, right, for people in previous generations. Yeah, absolutely. A lot has changed since the internet, for sure. And uh, here at Anarchapoco, February 27th to March 1st, we're going to have an entrepreneurship camp from ExoBase. I'm really excited about that. That's going to be a two-day camp. Uh, and uh, as Peter just pointed out, there's never really been a better time for entrepreneurs. Actually, there's never been a better time for entrepreneurs. What you do have to do, though, is pay attention to what's going on in the economy and finance and with the governments and regulations and all these sort of things. Uh, those things have gotten a lot worse. Uh, but in terms of our ability to create uh, value and wealth, uh, there's never actually been a better time. It's never been easier. As Peter pointed out, you couldn't just start up a, a newspaper uh, 30 years ago uh, with nothing and actually have a chance of succeeding, and now you can. And that's just one area. That's just media. Uh, there's so many other areas. So it's going to be fascinating. And Peter's going to be down here speaking at Anarchapoco, um, and so it's going to be good. And I'm happy to have a number of Austrian economics people here. Uh, Redmond Weisenberger, the founder of the Mises Institute of Canada, um, so I'm hoping to have some sort of Austrian sort of um, uh, style talks as well as some entrepreneurship style talks. So it's really going to be an interesting uh, event for people to be able to learn a whole bunch of different things. We're also going to be talking about expatriation. There's going to be a lot on that. Uh, it's going to be quite wide in, in, in its breadth, but uh, I think it's going to be very good. So I'm really happy to have you coming down, Peter. Great. I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, so we'll talk to you then. Uh, unless you have something else, uh, why don't you let us know you have a website um, where you uh, publish some stuff and let us know anything else about you. Uh, yeah, I've got a site called Profits of Chaos, uh, Profits with an F, uh, and I've got a, a monthly newsletter. Uh, you can find it over at ProfitsofChaos.com. Uh, it is free, uh, but it uses Austrian economics to assess what's going on in, in, uh, in the stock market. All right, so check that out and come on down to Narcopoco this February 27th to March 1st, right there on the beach right behind me. We're going to have a very interesting group of people, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. This is Anarchast.